طيب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so uh, in uh, so chapter one is an introduction to um, the uh, computer networks and uh, it it goes through th some of the terminology and the terms that you have uh, familiarized yourself with as part of any introduction introduction to computer networks course that you have gone through before I, I assume that all of you have gone through one introduction to computer networks course one way or another whether it's 455 in QU or outside at least you have got you have gone through a course about networks somewhere um, so this kind of uh, uh, a brief review about the main um, basic uh, concepts in, 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 the, uh, in this part and then um, in chapter 2 and chapter 3 we'll start to go through the, the layer stack um, so these uh, slides uh, are, part, are actually given uh, as part of the book but I actually made some modification uh, to the slides to serve the objective of the course so um, so again, so whatever is uh, whatever we discuss in class, you're asked to know it. Whatever we don't discuss in class, you're not asked to know it. Okay, so pay attention to what we exactly cover in class. So our goal, of course, is to review the basic concepts and unify the terminology. Again, you, you might find some of the terminology that's used in that book is slightly different from CCNA1 and CCNA2. So pay attention to these differences and try to stick to the on this terminology so that we can agree on a common language that we will use in the future. So, uh, so we're going to go through what's the internet, what is a protocol. Again, these are basic concepts. Uh, what is a network edge or uh, 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 an access network? What is the difference between the two? What is the physical medium? What is the network core? And what is the difference between packets and circuit switching and so on? How do we measure performance? Uh, in terms of loss, delay, uh, throughput, so and so on. And then uh, uh, the protocol layers, uh, the different uh, layers in the layer stack. So what's the internet? Well, the internet is, uh, as we all know, the internet is a, a group of interconnected networks which spans the, the whole world. Um, so the, uh, uh, the, the, the the internet is actually a group of end systems or end devices. And these end devices are like this laptop, like this tablet, like a cell phone. These end devices, these uh, devices constitute the interface of the user to the network. So these devices are the uh, uh, systems that we as users use to acquire certain service from, uh, from the network. Okay? And... <clears throat> uh, between these end systems, of course, there is a back uh, end uh, devices and, and cables and stuff uh, which facilitate the con communication between these devices. So these communication links, um, they may include fiber or copper cables or uh, radio or satellite. So the transmission medium itself could be, uh, uh, could be different. It could be fiber optics, coaxial, uh, we have studied in 455, like STP, UTP, and, and uh, coaxial cables, fiber optics, and also wireless as a medium, and also satellite, and so on and so forth. And you have the uh, network devices, network devices such as routers or switches. Uh, so the routers, they uh, act as information forwarding device. So it... Uh, it's similar to what you would do in a roundabout. So when you go to a roundabout, so you can go this way and this or this way or this way. So where do you go? So you need to have the knowledge of uh, where do you go in order to reach to your final destination in the shortest path possible. Okay. Of course, many, many factors uh, come into this picture because um, the shortest path is not necessarily the fastest path and so on and so forth. And that's why these routers have to have some intelligence. Not only that, there is some applications that uh, requires fast, some applications requires uh, uh, shortest path, even if, it's the, if they are not the fastest, and so on. So how do, you, how do you balance the load on all the intersections? Because if you don't do this, from the overall network point of view, you might have some traffic jams at, some, at certain parts. So there is 
some uh, intelligence on these routers, not only locally, but in some cases globally. These routers need to exchange some information in, some, in certain cases in order to make sure that the traffic inside the network is, is not congested somewhere. And of course, we'll talk about this in more details later. So in terms of uh, 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 physical view, the internet is a group of protocols. What is a protocol? A protocol is a set of, I should ask you this question. Uh, a protocol is um, a set of rules that govern the communication. So uh, if we as human beings, we, started, we start to talk to each other, uh, the protocol is the one that defines what language are we going to uh, use, uh, how do we start the communication? Uh, I say, Salaam Alaikum, you say, Salaam Alaikum, and then we start to talk. Yani some, some initial thing that has to happen in order to uh, uh, prepare both parties for successful communication. Okay? So if I say hello and you say, Salaam Alaikum, then we start to talk different languages, so we have some indication that we may not actually communicate efficiently. But uh, if we agree on a certain language and we agree what uh, 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 grammar we're going to use, what sentences are going to use, then the communication will be efficient and successful. <clears throat> so protocols in, in the network are the same thing. They define set of rules, including, for example, message format, timings, access methods, which we will uh, talk about. Uh, and these rules, they define the function of this protocol in a certain layer. And you have many of these protocols that interact with each other. And if you have these protocols interacting together, then you have successful communication or you have efficient communication. Uh, the internet itself has, uh, um, the, has some features in addition to these protocols. So these protocols are fine and they facilitate the communication, but there are some features in the internet that make the internet really uh, the, 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 the scalable network that we, that we have nowadays. Um, it's, it's loose hierarchy in the sense that um, there are no exact boundaries Otherwise, we cannot communicate across uh, the earth. So if there are some boundaries, like the boundaries that we have in the countries, then we cannot go um, over these boundaries and communicate to people in China or people in Egypt or people here and there. So the internet does not have this clear and, uh, and abrupt boundaries. It has some loose hierarchy, so although we have some domain for a network. A network has certain, a LAN, for example, has uh, a certain boundary, but that doesn't mean that you can communicate inside the LAN only. So you can communicate to other LANs on the internet. So you can, from one LAN, the information can move from one LAN to another, and so on, until it reaches to the final end. You can uh, uh, divide the hierarchy on the, of the internet as there are some LANs, and WANs and so on. Or you can define the hierarchy of the internet as tier one service provider, tier two service provider, tier three service provider, and so on. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Also, the internet <coughs> has public inter, uh, internet versus private intranet. Eva Alfar, what is the difference between internet and intranet? The intranet or the the intranet is inside one organization and the intranet is between two or more organizations. This is the extranet. The, 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 the main idea of the intra intranet is that you need to have private communication which is not exposed to the internet. Because ultimately you are using the exact same physical devices which are used to communicate to the internet. So how are we going to distinguish between this is a private traffic and this is a public traffic which is exposed to the internet? Like for example, imagine, as you said, it's for one organization. This is correct. 
So uh, uh, the branches of Microsoft or branches of Facebook, and they need to communicate to each other. Of course, these branches are distributed all over the world. But when they communicate, do you imagine that they can communicate and expose their information publicly? Of course not, right? So they need to have some private communication. It's, it's, it's distributed across, the, across different sites all, all over the world, but uh, they need to have their own private communication. So this is the concept of the intranet. The intranet is a private network, which is, again, it, physically it overlaps with the internet. But there are some technologies that make the traffic private, like what? You are confusing this with NAT, a private address versus public address. Maybe. No, that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. VPN. Yes. Security. Yes. Yeah. IPsec. These technologies, they, they facilitate this. So if you, if you use VPN to communicate with a specific network, then the traffic that goes through the VPN pipe is a private traffic. Nobody can see it. Okay? Although it still uses the same physical infrastructure of the network, but it's private, it's not exposed. So uh, VPN is, well, of course, there are some other possibilities, but VPN is the most common. Uh, so uh, between the branches of the same organization, they can use VPN in order to have their own private intranet, even using the, the same physical infrastructure, but this network is private. It's not exposed to the internet okay and of course um, the internet standards what, what, what is a standard what is a standard what is the difference between the standard and the protocol or when does the protocol become standard the protocol is, hmm? it is like a common language between two nodes two nodes yeah this is the protocol Correct, okay. When does it become a standard? When it's agreed upon groups, people that sometimes... International. Yeah. When it's agreed upon internationally, internationally by multiple vendors, okay, then it's a standard. What is the implication of this? Any vendor who implements the protocol in this way, in this standardized way, they expect their protocol to work with any vendor who has the same protocol. Because some protocols are proprietary. What is the difference between proprietary and standard? Proprietary is agreed upon within one or two organizations only. Like an example of this is Cisco EIGRP. EIGRP is one of the routing protocols which is very common, by the way, because Cisco is the predominant uh, 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 network supplier. Uh, that's why EIGRP is very commonly used. However, it's a proprietary protocol. It's not, it's not agreed upon internationally. But because the Cisco equipment covers maybe more than 95% of, of all the network devices, it's becoming what they call a de facto standard. But it's actually a preparatory. It's not, it's not a standard. Uh, a standard like TCP protocol is a standard. IP protocol is a standard. UDP protocol is a standard. There are some RFCs uh, on, the, on the internet on a website called IETF. This IETF website has all the protocol standards or the protocol specifications. So what happens is that um, one entity like let's say D-Link or Cisco, they come up with a specification for a certain protocol. And they say that this protocol provides this func function in, the, in this layer, and we think that this protocol is very good. Until this moment, it's a proprietary. A proprietary. It's not a standard. Okay? If Cisco promotes this protocol in the international bodies and gets it endorsed, by the multiple vendors all over the world, then it gets published on IETF or IEEE as an endorsed standard. Then it becomes a standard that all the vendors uh, uh, can implement. Is Go ahead. IEEE a standard or a 
No, IEEE is a, is, a, is a standard body. It's an organization that standardizes protocol. No, IEEE itself is not. But of course, uh, uh, all the standards that, that's done or that's uh, standardized by IEEE, they start with the word IEEE. It's just to make sure, uh, just to uh, say that this is done by IEEE. So you have, for example, IEEE 802.11. It's the most common. 802.16, and so on. Okay, so IEEE is the name of the organization that did the standard. They have many, many, many standards. Okay, uh, in the high, usually IETF focuses on the standards in the higher layer. So there is a, a website called IETF.org. Okay, so IETF. Dot org. This website, if you go to this website, you can search on TCP and you will have the RFC for TCP. And you will have the, all the specifications about TCP. Okay, it's, it's, it's published. Okay, and uh, this allows any vendor to get this specification, implement this protocol as part of Windows operating system, as part of Linux operating system, and as long as this protocol is implemented using this specification, Linux can, can talk to Windows, can talk uh, uh, on any other <coughs> operating system. Similarly, routing protocols or IP or any other protocol in the, in the network layer. If it's implemented in the router, whether this router is D-Link or Cisco or anything, they can talk to each other smoothly without any conflict because they both implement the same standards. Okay. Okay. Any questions? All right. So there, so we're still going through the basic concepts. Um, so communication infrastructure enables distributed applications. Like, of course, we have many applications: web applications, VoIP applications. There, there, there is an endless list of applications that we can have, and they are. These applications are are very diverse in terms of requirements that they can have. Some of these applications, like video applications, they have very uh, stringent requirements on the delay. It has to be real time. There is a huge amount of video content. Usually, have intensive amount of information versus web browsing, which is very light. Okay, so it it, it uses only like web page content, or so it's very light in terms of data requirements. So there are different requirements on these applications. And the network itself has to serve all these applications in the best way possible. Of course, there is a challenge uh, associated with this, which is what we will talk about uh, as quality of service. So we need to differentiate between these applications. Um, communication services provided to these, to these applications in order to facilitate their work. So you have the application itself, which is the software that the user uses to compose the information. Like, for example, uh, a web browser, a FTP client, things like that. Okay? So these applications, they use to compose the information. And then you have services. Services are back-end software, which is usually implemented in the operating system itself in the operating system of the laptop or the cell phone. Uh, these services are still software, but the user does not interact with these services directly. The user interacts with the application. The application uses these services. So these services implement TCP, implement IP, implement some other protocols, which we will briefly talk about, okay, in order to send this information over the network efficiently. So the services are the set of software which run in the background. It's not, they do not have interface to the user. They run in the background as part of the operating system to facilitate the interface to the network and therefore they are used to send the information over the network. So these services, they provide a, a set of, they, they provide certain experience to this information. Maybe a service like TCP, 
it provides some reliable communication. So it could be unreliable or it could be reliable. An example, UDP. UDP provides unreliable communication. So it sends datagrams or like uh, disjoint packets and it does not provide any reliability. Another service or a protocol which is TCP provides reliable communication. So when it sends a packet, it needs to receive an acknowledgement. If it doesn't, then it resends it again. Okay? So these are examples of uh, uh, protocols which are implemented as services in the operating system in order to uh, act as interface to the application or between the application and the network. Okay? Type. <clears throat> So as we said, uh, uh, what's a, a protocol? A protocol similar to uh, human beings. So when we start to communicate, when we start to communicate together, we, uh, we need to use certain protocol. We don't like sit down and talk about protocol. No, we, we just need to have a, an implicit set of rules in order to make sure that we, uh, uh, that we can communicate successfully. So we need to use the same language. We need to use certain grammar of the sentences, and we need to use certain timing. So if, if, if one of us talks for a long time, uh, the communication will not be efficient. So we have to use uh, small, reasonable sentences with some stops, and, uh, and we have to agree on the order. So, uh, um, so when I talk and I say a certain sentence or two, um, then I expect to have a reply if I don't get the reply, then my expectation will be that you didn't get what I'm talking about, so maybe I can say the same sentence in another way or something like this. So again, uh, similar to this communication that happens between human beings, network protocols act the same way, except that protocols are done by machines or they, they, they are used within the machines to facilitate this communication between the machines and the network. So. As a formal definition, so protocols define formats, order of messages sent and received amongst the network entities. And by network entities here, we mean any device on the network, whether it's an end device or a network device. Because there are some protocols that facilitate the communication between, for workstation and a router. Okay? Or router and a router, or a router and switch, or a switch and a router or router and another workstation, and so on. So, any network entity. And actions taken, action, by actions taken, we mean like, uh, stop this message at this point in time, wait until you receive some feedback. If you, don't get a, uh, uh, if you don't receive a feedback by a certain timeout, you assume that this message has been lost, so send it again. So this, this is a logic that needs to uh, be performed by the protocol in order to make sure that uh, there is a certain reliability in sending this information back and forth across the network. Okay? So that's the formal definition of a protocol. So that's, this is how, uh, how, how it's done. So the, uh, similar to the communication that happens between human beings also the, the protocol itself runs the same way. So uh, uh, there is a, a connection establishment, like an example, TCP. TCP uh, does connection establishment, and of course, as we have learned in other courses, it uses like 3D handshake. So can I connect to you? Okay, you can connect to me. Can I connect to you? Okay, you can connect, something, something like that. So uh, it's similar to the fact that when we first meet, we say hi and say hi. So this means that we, both of us, agree on the fact that we can, we, can, we can communicate. And then we start asking each other, each other questions, and then we get answers, and so on. So that's the, the exact same way uh, for TCP. So <clears throat> a network edge. So what is a network edge? Uh, there is a difference between the network edge and the network core. And there is a, a slight difference between a, a network edge and an access network. So we need to agree on that uh, terminology as well. Because the internet has certain edge networks and core networks. Okay? 
there is a, uh, uh, there is a difference between the two. And uh, even, even hatta for research, some people, they focus on edge networking for the research. Some people, they focus on core networking. Uh, I can tell you now that the core networks research is, 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 is very limited nowadays, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's maybe limited to people in Cisco and things like this. Um, the research in core networking is very limited. But the, in edge network, there is a big, huge opportunity in edge networking research. So, um, I will talk about it now. So, edge network. So, network edge focuses on the actual interface of the user to the network. So, this is a network edge. So, the internet is like set of edges uh, or a small LAN. Uh, this LAN can be wireless, can be wired, can be fiber optics, whatever. Okay? So this is the, 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 uh, the terminal part to the Internet. The Internet, it's the Internet in the back end has certain core routers. Okay? These core routers, the main <coughs> function of these core routers are just to route information from one place to another. But they do not have end devices. They do not have any interface to the user. Okay, and that's what I'm. That's 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 uh, why I'm saying that in the core network, maybe the research is a little bit limited. But in the edge network, because it's an interface to the to the user, and uh, the 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 services that we use nowadays are really diverse. There is huge amount of diversity to the services that we compose and we actually, in many cases, we invent. And some applications are uh, being you know, uh, uh, implemented every day. And these applications impose different characteristics and different requirements on the traffic that goes to the network. So how, how do we make sure that this traffic is really uh, massaged well, if, I, if you will, or, or maybe formulated in a good way in order to go smoothly in the core network, how do we make sure that this service is composed in the most efficient way so that when it's sent over the core network, we get the experience that we expect? Like on Skype, for example. <clears throat> like nowadays, especially nowadays, we're getting a very bad experience about Skype. Right? Yes. Why? Well, we know why. There are, there are some technical issues. But... Magically, if you use VPN at the edge network, all these issues will go away. Okay? So if I do this at the edge, and I prepare the traffic well, it will go smoothly in the corner. Skype? No. No, no, no. It has no, nothing to do with Skype. No. By ISP. <clears throat> By ISP, and it's not in Qatar. By ISP outside. Okay. So, so again, if, 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 if the ISP does not give you the proper uh, quality of service that you expect, you would find very bad quality and very bad uh, experience in using certain applications. But if you do the proper handling of this traffic at the edge and you prepare it well, then it can go smooth. Okay. Um, or you have, you have the proper agreement with the service provider, of course. You, you need to have the proper agreement with the service provider. It's not like you, you expect you to, to, uh, to generate a huge amount of traffic, but you are using a DSL line uh, that has a maximum rate of 1 megabits per second. Well, you're joking. <laughs> so I have this uh, 1 megabit per second uh, line, but uh, I need to run uh, 10 uh, Skype sessions, and, and, and well, you, you're not going to have this. So you need to have the proper plan with the service provider in order to have the experience that you expect. So <clears throat> this whole thing happens uh, at the edge. So the edge contains the end devices that interface the user to the core network. Okay? So that's what we're talking about here. Um, <clears throat> there is a slight difference between a network edge and an access network. The access network is the 
is the method that you use to access the internet. Okay? Is the method that you use to access the internet. From the edge to the internet. Like for example, uh, I have an edge network. Well, that's fine. If, if, if you don't have the proper access method to the internet, this edge is just an edge that you can communicate within, but you cannot communicate to the network. So you need to have a method that connects your edge network to the internet. And that could be through a bunch of different ways, which we will talk about in details now. Is this access network? Yeah, this is what we call access network. Yes, access network. Is it the link between us? Yes, exactly. It's, it's actually, but it, it's, it's a full network. This is a network. Yeah. Yeah, this is a network. Access network, yes. Access network is the network that gives you access to the internet. It gives you access to this core. Okay? So there is an edge network and there is a core network. And in the middle, there is the access network that gives you that access to the, to the internet or to the core network. Okay? And that could happen using a bunch of different technologies, which we will talk about in a minute. Um, and there is, of course, the network core. The network core is purely interconnected routers and switches and things like that, which is usually owned by service providers, whether it's tier one or tier two or tier three service providers. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so the the network edge has the uh, end systems, and these end systems they uh, run applications or programs. And uh, these applications, they can run using two different architectures. They can use what we call client-server model or peer-to-peer -peer model. What is the difference between the two? Is there another name for the client-server model? What? Like what? Host, uh, host something? Or I'm... Eh? Host something? Host... Your... No. no. <laughs> Not that I know of, Yanni. <laughs> What is the difference? What, what is a client server model? The peer to peer is between two PCs. Between two PCs, Iwa? Mm -hmm. Two different networks, okay. Okay, what is, what is, a, what is a server? Like a web browser or. No, the server is not a web browser. A like client or a web browser. Hmm? Like Google, like uh, YouTube. YouTube. Okay, so client server model, you have a, a, a distinction between set of machines you call them client and another set of machines you call them server. The, di the main difference between the client and a server is that a server, usually it's a huge machine, fixed, usually fixed machine with fixed IP address that provides certain service. It does not initiate the communication. The server, from its name, it's a, it's a machine which gets connected to in order to provide that service. So you request the service from the server, and then the server will give you this service. An example is web server. So when you browse and you, you, you put the URL, what happens is that your client, your web browser, will communicate to the URL that you, uh, uh, that you have in, the, in this link, and it communicates to this web server, and then the web server will give back the client the web content of, the, of that web page. So when you request, you say google.com, you, you send a request to the web server at Google, and then this web server will give you the content of this, of this web page back to the client. So the client is always the one that initiates the communication. It's always the one that requests the service. And the server is always the one that provides the service. Okay? So always the request comes from the client and the server gives back the response as a service. Okay? And usually, of course, client server promotes the fact that all the clients, they connect to the same server. So there is a, some kind of a centralization. In other words, if that server is down, this service is gone. You cannot, plus, this server is gone. This service is gone. So all the users cannot communicate to, the, to that server. Okay? Another example is an FTP server or a YouTube 
server. So when you again when you when you uh, when you try to stream any video, you communicate with one YouTube server which is located somewhere. Hmm? And then this server will stream back the video content to you. And on the browser you see it. So the browser is your client that, you, that initiates the communication and acquires this service from the server. Peer-to-peer -peer is different. Peer-to-peer -peer talks about the fact that any device on earth can act as a peer. A peer is client and server at the same time. Okay? So any, any device, my cell phone, can act as a peer, in which case it's a client and server at the same time. So it can initiate the communication and it can provide the service. Okay? Or can respond to a, a communication that comes from another device. What is the implication of this? Because of the fact that the server, as I said, is a fixed machine and it's usually large scale and the IP address for it is fixed and well known and stuff, all the clients, they communicate to that server in a centralized way, they get the content, they get the service. It's a well-established method. So we all know how to use client-server model. Because, the, again, the server is fixed and we all know the IP address, we connect to it. The, the, the problem with peer-to-peer -peer is that my device can act as a peer at any point in time. Well, what is the implication of this? The implication of this is that the peer-to-peer Network needs to know the fact that my machine or my cell phone has come to the picture. How, how, how does this happen? So th there is a challenge now because, um, like for example, the BitTorrent. BitTorrent does not host any content on a server. All the contents are actually hosted on these devices. So if my machine is open, the content of this machine will get exposed to the peer-to-peer -peer network. If my device is not open, then this content is not there. So, in other words, the content is actually distributed amongst all the peers. <coughs> which is challenging because if you want to, uh, for example, if you get to uh, BitTorrent and, and you want to search for a movie or search for any video that you want, um, then it needs to be able to magically find that movie where it is exactly on any device all over the world. And then it takes it from another device. Yeah, because, yes, because it gets it from my device. And this is not a fixed server. Yeah. This is just a peer. It acts as a server and a client at the same time. So I can use, uh, like, for example, Emule or any peer-to-peer -peer client to try to search for a movie. And at the same time, at the same concurrently, someone else is connecting to my device to download another movie from my machine. So my, my, my device acts as a client and a server at the same time. And as you can imagine, I cannot host a huge amount of content. It's just a small set of movies or files. So somehow, magically, the peer-to-peer -peer network needs to know where these files are on any device all over the world. Okay? And you have an example of Skype. Uh, does that mean that any application you use is peer to peer? Like, for example, I use WhatsApp and I WhatsApp someone. So it's peer to peer. Yes, that's, that's another example of peer to peer. Okay. Because you can, you can request to communicate to him or he can request to communicate back to you. However, when we say that everything is distributed, then that's not 100% correct. So because, why? Because when, when we say that the content itself is, is distributed, so imagine if we, uh, this, let's just use technology a little bit. So, uh, so you have a client here and a client here and a client here. So you have many clients all over the world. I have some content here and I have some content. Whatever this content is, could be a set of files, it could be some text, it could be videos, whatever. So this content is now distributed all over the world. So if, if, if I'm here and I want to fetch uh, uh, a movie, so I say I get to the peer-to-peer -peer network using my peer-to-peer -peer application and I say, 
search for that movie. Okay? So, logically, what you would expect is that this application needs to first try to crawl over the, over the internet and try to search for any peer-to-peer -peer <coughs> application one by one, okay? Assuming that I can do that, assuming that I know exactly that this guy is running peer-to-peer -peer application and this guy is running peer-to-peer -peer application and so on, so I need to go through them one by one and for each one I ask them, do you have this movie? You say, no, do you have this movie? This. Of course, if you do this on millions of devices or thousands of devices, it's not realistic, okay? Um, and you, you, you would not expect when you uh, go to WhatsApp and you say, I want to communicate with that person, that it, it, it gives you the answer after one hour. Of course, that does not happen. So, <clears throat> so what, 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 uh, what do we do in that case? We have a directory server, which, is, which goes back to the client server. But the difference here is that this is a directory server. It's not a content server. So this directory server, when I start my application here, the application connects to the directory server, and it tells the directory server that I am active now, and by the way, I have this content. And when I say I have this content, I don't give it the content. I give it only, like for example, the name of the movies that I have. Of what the name of the of the files that I have, only the names, not the not, what you want. not the actual files, not the actual files, only the names or some high level description of what I have. Okay, similar. Uh, uh, similarly, this this will do the same. So at the end, this directory server will have the fact that this content is on this device. Remember. This is only the, the high-level the, the high description of that content. It's not the content itself. Oh, you get the title of the file. The title of the file, the only. <clears throat> so this movie is with this guy. This movie... The... So there is a, a big implication about this is that on one hand, the content is still distributed, but the, where the content is is centralized. Okay. On the other side, and this was actually the main objective of, uh, of the peer-to-peer -peer network when they first invented it, is that there's no liability. There's no li I'm not hosting any content. You cannot uh, uh, hold me liable because I'm not hosting anything. Yeah, the email servers or the BitTorrent servers or, or something like this. I'm not hosting anything. I'm just recording the fact that this guy has this. How can I be held accountable for knowing the fact that this guy has this? So actually, there was a big lawsuit on, on, on this because this, this architecture promoted the huge amount of illegal content on the internet. Because if, if you host all the content on one server, then this server has to be legitimate, has to be official. and So it makes sense. But, but here, you're not hosting anything. So it's, it's a big, big challenge for, for, for a lot of people. Mm. There's lack of security also in the peer-to-peer. There's also lack of security because, of course, you can connect to uh, anyone and get any file with viruses, and, which is potentially what we have nowadays. Uh, can we access our photos? I just have a question. Yes, yes. Well, but, but, but the, the, uh, again, the, the, only the directory on your machine that you that you expose it to the... It's not all the information on your machine is part of, of the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, network automatically. No. You, when you start the peer-to-peer -peer application, you say, my content is hosted in this directory only. So this is the directory where I want to share with others. Any other data is, is just private for me. Okay? But still, I mean, some people, they host all kinds of, you know, harmful uh, content and uh, you can potentially download and get some viruses on your machine and things like that. So, so the peer-to-peer -peer architecture is, um, <clears throat> is, 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 is actually tricky, but 
the idea of peer-to-peer -peer has been promoted um, in many applications after that. So uh, Skype uses the same idea more or less, except that there's no content on the, there's no like actual files. Uh, but again, in, in Skype, you get the list of users and you get how they are active or not active and stuff like this is this is also part of a directory server uh, in Microsoft that hosts the fact that person X is now so when you start Skype it connects to that server and give that server the fact that you are active or your status what it is and things like that so uh, but when you say I want to communicate with that person that's peer-to-peer because what will happen is that the directory server will say, okay, if you want to communicate with that guy, here is the IP address of that person. It gives you back the IP address of that person. And then you, you create a direct session with that person. So the directory server is out. And then you communicate in real time. So the voice goes back and forth between your machine and his machine only. It doesn't go through any server or any, any other device. Right, exactly, to the directory server. So uh, uh, when you connect to the directory server, it gives you description where each file is. So when I search on a specific file, it's fast, right? Because again, where each file is, is, is centralized. So you get the answer very fast. But once you say, I'm interested to get that file, then it connects you directly to that machine. That's the main difference. Client server, everything is centralized. The directory is centralized and the content is centralized. Then the fact? But in this case, again, the directory server is also required. Of course. So if it is not there, then. Of course. If it's not there, the only, the only uh, way to get where each file is is by crawling through all the other machines on, on the internet, which is not feasible. So, but at the same time, it is also tracking that this file is with Yes. Suppose uh, it is with a group of four people. And right. I want this file. Right. So I will first contact the directory server. Right. This is with these four guys. Right. So then I will directly connect it to these four and then start getting this file. Yes. So you have so now right. you have flexibility. Right. Maybe the directory server will give you the flex flexibility that uh, he will select the one with the highest bandwidth so that your download speed will be fast. Or it will say, okay, since this uh, file is hosted on four different devices, I'm going to give you the flexibility to connect to all the four of them and download different parts of the file from different, from different persons. So this way, the download will be even faster. But this will require the fact that the client needs to be intelligent enough to consolidate all these parts and create the file for you, which is a bit challenging, but it's... it's but uh, as it's soon done. as I get a complete <clears throat> file, then the directory server knows that I am the fifth person now. Yes, exactly. So how exactly. will happen? This is the software will do this one? Yes, yeah. There is a peer-to-peer -peer application that you download, and it does all of this. So once you download this file, given that you put this file in the directory that you expose, because maybe your, your, your download directory is different from the peer-to-peer -peer directory that you expose it to the network, okay? Only when you download this file and then you copy it to the directory where you want to expose it to the network, the directory server will, a, will get updated and will, will store the fact that another fifth person has this file. Okay, we know the difference now. Okay. So access networks, how do we, how do we access uh, the internet? There are different technologies uh, some of them we are familiar with. Some of them maybe it's new for uh, some of you or maybe all of you. Um, so uh, there is a, a residential access uh, networks and there is institutional access networks. Residential access networks, um, these are access networks that we use for our houses, for individuals, versus an institutional access networks. These are usually used by organizations like QU, so we don't expect QU to access the internet in the exact same way that we use in our houses. Okay, so it's, uh, most probably it's more sophisticated and, and, and they use different complicated technology. So we need to discuss what 
are the common types of these access networks. I want to fulfill my promise to you, so I will, I will just cover one or two and then stop. Uh, one which is uh, probably still the most common worldwide, although it's not as common in Qatar. In, in Qatar, the, 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 the predominant now is, is fiber. We'll talk about that in the next slide. It's fiber. Fiber, fiber to whom, right? But DSL was the, was the most common one. And it's still the, the most common worldwide. So DSL talks about the digital subscriber line. Digital subscriber line, it's a technology that uses our telephone lines. Because uh, uh, the motivation for this, of course, is that we all have land, or at least used to have landlines. Uh, we have public switch telephone networks, which is well established and it's running for years and decades and stuff. So we all have telephone lines. So if we have a technology like this, which uses or leverages the infrastructure of the phone lines, then we can deploy it everywhere very fast. So the idea here is very simple. So we have our phone lines at home, right? So what we need to have is that we need to also have our PCs, which composes information, data, not by actually voice calls and stuff, but we need to compose our information. And then we need to use the same telephone line. The good thing about the telephone lines is that we have dedicated telephone lines to the service provider. Each one of us has dedicated, each house yani, has dedicated phone line to the service provider. We have this infrastructure already in place. And that's why in the, in, in the way past we used to wait for years to get our phone lines at home. It's not, it, it was not an easy job. Yeah, but, but now, of course, it's easy. But we used to have it, didn't we? Like, um, I'm talking about like uh, seven years ago or ten. Mm -hmm. Yes, 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 yes. But now, yeah, alhamdulillah, we're blessed with the fiber optics and stuff, it's, which is much faster, of course. It's, well, it's not, worldwide it's not. But it's Fika and Qatar is very well advanced compared to other countries. And the main reason for this is that Qatar is a small country. If you have technologies, new technologies like this, you can deploy it everywhere very fast and very cost effective. So imagine if you want to cover uh, United States with fiber optics. Good luck. Yeah, it's it's uh, huge areas. Yeah. Yeah, and you, just, you can imagine the number of houses and, and the, the roads and stuff that you need to have. So that's why they didn't do it because, uh, what? It yes, of course. Everything has a cost factor. Oh. Yeah. In Qatar, it, it's not as expensive because the area is small. Alhamdulillah, the country is rich, so we can do it. Yeah. It's feasible. For them, it's feasible. But in other countries... Yeah, it's not, it's not feasible. That's why uh, fiber optics has not been deployed in the States, widely at least, has not been deployed in, in other countries, big countries, Egypt, China, and it's not as common. Uh, so the main idea here is that the, the telephone line itself is uh, uh, some, it's uh, it, it actually very similar to U, uh, um, UTP, you know, the, uh, 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 um, yes, um, unshielded twisted pair, okay? So it has, but it has, I think, four lines only. In any case, these lines have a theoretical bandwidth of hundreds, hundred megahertz or something like this. The, 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 the main idea here is that our voices, our voices actually has a, a full bandwidth of four, four kilohertz. Physically, I mean, our voices has a bandwidth of four kilohertz. So technically, you have from 4 kilohertz all the way to 100 megahertz. All of this is, is technically is not used. Okay. Um, so that was the main idea. So if we can somehow get the information from the PCs and, and, and all the digital devices at home and compose it and send it over a signal, which runs, if we were to put the frequency spectrum of the signal, as I said, the voice takes from 0 to 4 kilohertz. 
And then you have from 4 kilohertz all the way to uh, 100 megahertz or something like that. Not used. Of course, it's not as, as simple as that. Uh, of course, because the voice is, gets digitized, and thing, so it, it gets a little bit more than 4K. But again, you still have a huge amount of bandwidth which is not used. So somehow, if we were to get the, 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 the digital uh, data that we have from PCs and send it over this part in the frequency spectrum, it will not interfere with our voices. But we have to do this carefully. So what happens is that we have a, a DSL modem which does exactly that. What it does is that it actually gets the digital information and it composes this over a signal, over an electric signal, and then it shifts this signal in the frequency to work in, in, the, uh, in the free bandwidth. And then this signal gets mixed. This is a splitter or a mixer. So in one direction, it works as a mixer or a multiplexer. It mixes the voice with the data. But when you mix that in the frequency domain, there is no interference. OK? So as we have learned in 455, you can send two signals at the same time on two different frequencies. There is no collision. Right? If we send, if you send two signals, but in two different frequency ranges, then there's no collision, right? Only if you send two signals at the same time, at the same frequency, there is collision, right? So this is the main idea. If you mix the two signals in the frequency domain, there's no problem. On the way back, so it goes through, it goes to the, to the dedicated telephone line all the way to the subscriber. The subscriber has the reverse operation. The subscriber, sorry, the service provider. The service provider then has two types of networks. And we'll talk about the fact that these two networks are actually merged nowadays. So we'll talk about this later. So the service provider has public switch telephone networks, which I should use to send the voice calls. And it also has certain routers which needs to go to the internet. Okay, so at the service provider, we have what we call digital subscriber line access multiplexer. The access multiplexer will do the reverse operation, will separate the voice from the A, from the D. Using what, basically what this does, it filters out. It gets the, uh, uh, the digital data using a filter in this range of frequency, and it, it routes this to the internet. And it filters the other part, the voice, and it sends it to the public switch telephone number. Yes, exactly, using DSPs. And filters, basically filters, DSP filters. OK? When you send this to the, uh, 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 to the internet, then eventually it goes to another subscriber. So uh, the, again, if, if I want to receive on the way back, I can receive phone calls or I can receive digital data. So the splitter in that case will do the exact same operation that's done by the access multiplexer, but on an individual user level. Because this access multiplexer will do this from multiple users. The splitter acts for one individual user. So this splitter will split again, the digital data will send it to the modem, and then the, the voice calls will send it to the, to the phone. And then the modem will, will convert back this physical signal in this bandwidth to the base band and then to send it to the... Okay, so this is the main idea. The digital subscriber line, is, we call it uh, in many cases asynchronous. Yani asynchronous. Uh, they, they, they did some statistics and they found that in most of the cases we download something. But our devices you typically do not work as servers, especially that in the past, peer-to-peer -peer was not that common. So the, the idea that I use my machine as a server was not very common. So in other words, I need faster download speed more than the upload. Because usually, upload will be used to request a service, and then I receive content. 
That's typically what happens. So I need faster download speed and less fast on the upload side. And that's why the, 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 the DSL usually uses what we call asynchronous speed. So they, uh, for up to one megabits per second in upstream, but in the downstream, it can go to a eight megabits per second. Okay? So it, it's asynchronous. It's not, uh, yani this bandwidth actually is divided between upstream and downstream. So you have, um, you have part of this bandwidth for the upstream and another part for the downstream. Okay? And uh, of course, the upstream bandwidth is less compared to the downstream bandwidth. And we'll, 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 uh, we'll see the actual uh, numbers now. Okay? Any? So this, is, this is 30 or 1 Mbps of upstream and 8 Mbps downstream. Up to, yes. Due to the limitation of the... Of course. Uh, but, 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 yes, but remember that telephone lines are dedicated. Sure. Are dedicated lines. So, in many cases, DSL bandwidth is actually... Yeah, and you can count the protocol overhead. So when I say one megabits per second, it's probably 800K or something like that. But because the, the, the line itself is dedicated, you get, if, if, the, if the service provider allows you for that one megabits per second, then you should get eight, 800 or, some, or 900 counting the protocol overhead. But uh, we will talk about another technology which in which case the line is not dedicated for one user. The line is dedicated for multiple users. In which case the bandwidth will be shared. So when I tell you, let's say one megabits per second, but it's shared amongst multiple users. So depending on these users, uh, uh, active or not, the bandwidth, the, the actual speed that you can get, maybe 200, 100, depending on how much load um, uh, uh, the others use, other users are injecting to the network. Okay, any, uh, any, any questions in that part? So I will stop here just to... Uh, one more question mm. here. Like uh, when you go to the central office, uh -huh. the central one, the central office is connected to the central office. Like Doha and Masai. They are also connected by one line. No, uh, so we, here we're talking about the, this, the first service provider, which is like the tier three service provider or the tier two service provider. So you are... Here we're talking about the access networks. Because once you connect one service provider, the service provider will split phone calls from digital data. And the phone calls will go through the public switch telephone networks. Data will go through. So they may go to another service provider, but this is phone call or this is data only. So from the first service provider, you're dealing with only one type of data. So this, this needs to be done only at the first service provider. Yes. Okay. For our case, it's Uridu or Vodafone. Okay. Well, they will do this. But they then from Uridu, 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 they can communicate to Verizon. AT&T, later on, it's like the tier one service providers. In that case, they are communicating only one type of data, either data or voice calls. AT&T is, AT is a tier one service provider. Like Uridu, they, they actually get the service from another larger scale service providers. Okay. So that is only for ISD calls, no? For, for? For international calls, no? That's well, yeah, for international calls, if we were to use the public switch telephone network, or for uh, internet access, if we were to, co to communicate some digital data. We still need, if we want to communicate, mass to the states or yeah. to any parts of the world, then it goes through another higher tier service provider, whether this is AT&T or any other service provider, the information goes to that service provider. But in that case, we're talking about one type of data, either phone calls or digital data. Yeah, and we don't have to do this at every single service provider. You don't have to split the information. It's done at the first service provider, and that's it. Okay? Each service provider has one center office. For example, in Doha, we have Budapur and uh, Uri, for example. Yeah, we have many offices, but we have... Yeah, they have, of course, yani, of, of course, there are, yeah, there are many uh, DSL AMs uh, everywhere. Yani, for example, 
uh, uh, each one of these covers like a district or a, a, يعني a limited geographical area. Uh-huh. Okay. One DSLAM is connected to uh, Oridu Sky internet backbone, huh? or it is uh, network, yes, which connects to another backbone of another service provider, like AT&T or Verizon or something like this. The internet architecture itself is divided into, uh, uh, divides the service providers into tiers. Tier one service providers, like, there are very few of them all over the world, like AT&T, Verizon. So these, they have interp- huge enterprise routers which usually covers a يعني, huge amount of, and of course they use fiber optics and they use very, very high speed uh, uh, routers. Um, they provide this infrastructure as a service to tier two service providers. And then the tier two service providers, they provide this service to another tier three service providers. Usually there are no, not more than three tiers of service providers or three levels of service providers on the internet. Not more than that. <clears throat> Any uh, questions? So we'll stop here, inshallah, continue next time.